Well, hello there, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Real Estate Investing with Jay Connor. I'm Jay Connor, your host, and also known as the Private Money Authority. And if you're brand new to the show, I want to give you a special welcome. We talk about all things real estate investing here, from single family houses to commercial to land to everything you can think of how to get funding for your deals, how to find deals, how to find motivated sellers before other real estate investors know they exist, and etc. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so if you've been tuning in and uh, following the show, you know I've had just some amazing guests and experts here since we launched the show a little bit over a year ago. You're part of a movement. We've hit almost 200,000 downloads and listens. And so if you are tuning in from iTunes, be sure to uh, subscribe, rate, and review so you don't miss out on any of this fantastic guests that I have on here. If you're watching one of our YouTube channels, be sure to subscribe and hit the uh, hit the bell so uh, you'll be notified when we go live. Before I bring on my guest today, which you are going to be totally fascinated with, I got a free gift for everybody, and that is if you're looking for more funding for your real estate deals uh, without having to rely on hard money lenders or mortgage brokers or loan companies, I've got a free online class just waiting for you to go uh, learn the five steps of how to get millions of dollars in funding like I have uh, very quickly. Uh, and so that website is www.jayconner.com forward slash money podcast. That's jayconner.com forward slash money podcast. Well, my guest today has become a very dear friend. We've gotten to know each other over the years. We've shared stages together. And, you know, since we launched the show, I have yet to have a self-storage guest on here. And there's a reason, in my opinion, and I am telling you like it is, my guest, Scott Myers, is the foremost, period, authority when it comes to self-storage. That's why I haven't had anybody else. And secondly, He's like travels the world all the time and it's hard to get him nailed down to get him on the show. But before I bring Scott on, I want to tell you just a little bit about his background because he's got the credentials like nobody else. He's known, as I said, as the nation's expert in self-storage. Now, a few years ago, he was a penniless landlord in the single family rental and apartment business. And then he began investing in self-storage. So we are both spiritually minded guys. So to put it in his words, he saw the light <laughs> and quickly sold all of his single family rentals and apartments to create this empire. He calls it a small empire. I call it an empire of self-storage facilities nationwide. Now his company's focus on syndicating self-storage deals and helping others launch their own self-storage business to enjoy a lifestyle free from tenants and toilets and trash. As a matter of fact, because we cross paths quite a bit, I have run into a lot of his students that have learned from him about self-storage, and he has got a long, long list of very, very successful students in self-storage that have quit the day jobs, gone full-time, and are really enjoying the freedom that he and his family enjoy as well. So he's the principal in 30 facilities, totaling over 7,000 units. He's got over 1 million square feet of storage. And he's also the founder and the president of selfstorageinvesting.com. You definitely want to take a note of that website, selfstorageinvesting.com. He's got a leading self-storage education company that offers courses, live events, mentoring, and coaching. And so his company was started back in 2006 for the purpose of acquiring and developing and operating self-storage facilities. And he's raised over $20 million in syndicates and private equity partnerships to fuel their growth. So Scott and I have got a lot in common, particularly when it even comes to the private money world. So with that introduction, Scott mm -hmm. Myers, my dear friend, welcome to the show. Well, my gosh, Jay, thanks so much and uh, happy to be here. Absolutely. So Scott, we've got about 20 minutes for uh, today's show. So I don't want to take up much time with rambling. I want us to go ahead and jump right in. So how did you get interested in self-storage and how and what happened that caused you quickly to, as you say, mm -hmm. see the light? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I think like most folks, uh, we break into the real estate business by buying a, a single family house. And that's uh, what it started for me back in 1993. Uh, 
I had um, another uh, a dear friend, mentor to uh, pretty much uh, all of us, Carlton Sheets, bought his home study system and followed along his program and uh, bought my first rental house and uh, rehabbed it, refinanced it, pulled cash out to go then buy two more. Rented it out, you know, with the, the goal of, you know, at that time, he talks about 175 to $225 a month in positive cash flow. And so, yeah, that's when we were rolling along, buying houses, continue to just uh, rinse and repeat. And what we found, however, is that, you know, all it took was for a tenant or two to, to leave the portfolio. And there went the profitability in, in a year's time uh, with the turnaround costs and lost rent and chasing that. So I thought, well, okay. Economies of scale will fix this. I'll just work a little bit harder and ramp things up. So I got into apartments and started buying uh, apartments. And we already had about 80 houses and I wasn't experiencing the freedom and all the cash flow that Carlton and all the other gurus talked about. So I thought, I, well, I'll ramp it up and buy apartments and you know, have management companies run them, be rid of a lot of the management headaches myself. And you know, having a, a whole lot of units will you know, cure this problem. Well, all they did was just create more units with more problems, and so and now in we other words, in other words, in other words, volume will fix it, right? I'm losing, uh, ten, I'm losing ten thousand on this one, so I'll do a hundred more, right? Uh, the braid, yeah, yep, yeah, yeah. Somehow the math didn't work out, uh, as you can imagine, and so you know, it. I mean, it's it, it's a tough. That's a, it, it's just a tough nut. I mean, uh, until you get to that, that that critical you know point where you you cross that line of either bringing management in house or you know, where the expenses that do catch up, you know, just um, running up even, you know, a few hundred houses is, it, it's kind of tough to, to make that work, especially to weather an economic cycle or anything else uh, unforeseen. And so that's what we were faced back. This is back in 1999 and 2000 with that, right. that, that recession, the one prior to the, the great recession, when then the administration, the president um, came out with the community reinvestment act and felt, well, They'll spark the economy uh, by offering this act whereby anybody who can make, basically walk into a bank and fog a mirror can get a, a, a loan for a home. I remember. And, so, and they did. And our, our tenants left in droves and who could blame them? I mean, that was uh, the best time in, in our nation's history that they could uh, do that. Well, then we were faced with uh, some high, high vacancy uh, rates and then expensive costs to try to rehab those to then sell because that's what the market was uh, proving at this point is that we had uh, to sell. So we made it through that. Only for five to six years later to see, you know, the unfortunately the the downfall, um, the extreme downfall of that community reinvestment act. Now those loans were defaulting, and here we go. Two thousand eight is the second time around. Um, the you know the second um, you know pitfall with that um, horrible horrible act. So then um, we found ourselves at at that point we had been buying self storage facilities, and I realized that you know what at this point it wasn't the the business model or even the economy. And the problem was is that tenants have more rights than the landlords do and uh, they can skip out they can destroy your property and, and the courts will call it non-payment of rent and excessive wear and tear you know well in my book it's stealing and it's you know defaming our property i mean the things that they were doing and so when you take the the tenant and the toilet out of the equation you're left with two other forms of real estate uh, or else i was going to throw in the towel and that's parking lots and self-storage and so i started looking into self-storage realize that if they don't pay, if, uh, if your clients are not tenants because they don't live there, if they don't pay, you, you lock them out and then you sell their stuff off and you recoup your money. And I was like, hey, that's good. And then when we uh, do a turn on them, you know, it wasn't replacing or you know, cleaning or replacing carpet and drywall and, you know, lost rent and all those other issues. Basically, we, we were left with an empty unit, which is a steel box on a concrete slab. And you take a broom and sweep it out or a blower and in, in 30 seconds, blow it out and you move in the next person waiting in line. So, to answer your question, it was uh, the sum of total of uh, not having to deal with tenants and toilets and the courts, and then my turns being a, a blower and a broom to sweep them out and then moving the next person waiting in line. That's when I saw the light and realized that this business is set up for the investors to win, not for the tenants to win. And so we sold all our houses and apartments and then uh, just went um, whole hog into self-storage and I uh, haven't turned back. I only own one house and it's uh, the one that I live in and sometimes work out of as I am this afternoon. <laughs> I got you. When uh, you were just mentioning, and I was just making a note as you were mm -hmm. talking, I wanted you to list the benefits of self-storage as, you know, contrasting to other real estate investing, but you just <laughs> hit on some of them. I mean, but if you were like to give a yeah, list yeah. of those benefits, what comes to mind? Yeah, I, I think that's it. I think, uh, first of all, you know, when you realize <laughs> when we sold our last apartment complex, my wife said, and that was the last of any residential we had, we are already getting rid of the houses, our last apartment complex. She goes, what do you notice it's different this morning? And I said, I don't know, your hair? Did you get a haircut? You know, you never know with a loaded question like that. <laughs> and she said, uh, no, she said, you know, it's, it's quiet. It's extremely quiet. And it was, you know, we didn't have 
the phone calls, even from the management companies or anybody else, it was just quiet because we had, and at this point we had several hundred units, but it was just people's stuff and the stuff doesn't call. As we said, the, the, the beauty of self-storage is the fact that we have the protection of the lien laws versus eviction laws. And so under the lien laws in every state, when a, when a client is uh, late, then we lock them out. We have the right legally to do so. And then after 90 days, we can auction their unit off and recoup our money, just like the storage wars and all the other shows on TV. It's, you know, the rule of thumb in houses and apartments is uh, 10 hours a week for every 100 units or so. And then in, in self-storage, it's 10 hours a week for every 400. So Ooh, really? Are, yeah, it's, it's, it's just the little amount that we have to spend in, in oversight and management of self-storage. It's a you know four to one just because it's stuff. It's not tenants that we're chasing or writing letters to because they're acting badly, parking on the lawn, fighting with each other, fireworks, dogs pooping everywhere. <laughs> we just don't have those, those management headaches. And then the, probably the, the best, as far as an investment standpoint, whether you're an investor passively or actively, it's just, it's the recession proof and inflation proof sector of the economy. When times are good, we buy more stuff and we store more stuff. When we head into a recession, people downsize, businesses downsize, and they put even more stuff into storage. So it, it continues to go up into the right when times are good, <clears throat> but during a recession, it, it spikes and we get the hockey stick effect and storage actually does better. And that's also at the same time that, that developers have a tough time finding funding, which means there's less development. So we have the perfect storm during a recession, which is this huge increase in demand and less uh, supply coming online. So, you know, we're really getting ready. Our Super Bowl is coming up here in this next uh, correction, and we have a war chest of equity partners and cash. So we're getting ready to take advantage of some of these properties where the owners didn't um, really build value into them and they have different ratios in their refinance. They bought it at a 80% LTV and now they can only refinance at 65 to 70 and they'll have to give it back to the bank or developers who maybe you know lost their credit lines when, you know, just like the last, well, several recessions um, that happens and we're going to step into some of those projects as well. So for all those reasons, you know, we love self-storage and we're getting ready and, and uh, we, we love it. Times are great. Good for self-storage. When we head into a recession or correction, it's even better. So um, yeah. That, that's, that's the business amazing. model that we love. So you just mentioned um, <clears throat> private equity. So, uh, you got private equity partners or private lenders lined up, ready to go as to when you mm -hmm. need the cash. So that triggers this question. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, through your own business and through your students, I mean, you've been exposed to thousands, I suppose, of, of self-storage possibilities or mm -hmm. deals to look at. What percentage, if you if you really had to nail it down, what percentage would you say owners of self-storage facilities will sell with seller financing versus what mm -hmm. percentage have you got to come up with the cash? Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting, Jay, um, a whole lot more than when I was looking at, at houses and apartments. And here's why, you know, typically with the houses and apartments of people that were offering it, they had to in order to sell it because they were backwards on it and they didn't have the value in it. Whereas in self-storage, it's really, it's co the complete opposite. And that these owners, these mom and pop owners or developers, you know, they, they bought them years ago. They developed them from the ground up years ago. They paid them off. They paid them down. So they have zero basis or a very low basis, which means when it comes time to sell, they're going to have to pay capital gains taxes. And they don't want to pay capital gains taxes. So we found that these folks are, are willing, you know, even before we would give them our prepared speech as to why they should sell <laughs> with seller financing, they would even say to us that, you know, we're willing to participate or finance a, a large portion of this, if not the majority, because we don't want to pay capital gains taxes. And so if I had to say a percentage, I'd say, you know, years ago, probably from 05 to 2012, there's probably more that we were looking at when we were buying a lot of the existing self-storage facilities and just because the valuations were a little bit higher. We saw more of them than we're seeing them today within the past few years, but that, that's going to happen again. Once again, when we head into a correction, these folks that are, that are now, it's time to exit and, and sell. That I, I'd say back during those years when we were buying a lot of existing facilities, probably anywhere from 30 to 40% of our deals had some form of, of seller participation in the deals. Less now, but again, when we head into a correction, when it's a little bit more difficult to get financing, and these folks are, are wanting to sell without having to pick up against Texas, I think we'll be back at that number again. Right. So, you know, I live mm -hmm. here in Moorhead City, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Our entire county's got 65,000 people, small area, like in my buying and selling house business, my total target market's only 40,000 people. So here's my question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm brand new. I don't mm -hmm. know anything about self-storage, but mm -hmm. it's really intriguing. Well, yep. the first thing I need to do is come to your training for sure. But mm -hmm. if I'm brand new, 
Mm-hmm. How do I decide, is my hometown an area that needs more self-storage or mm-hmm. should I, you know, should I be looking around, making some offers? In other words, how do you decide yeah. mm-hmm. where to invest in self-storage? Right. You know, the grass is always greener and everybody always wants to, you know, the question they ask me, okay, Scott, what markets are you investing in? You know, where's, where's the self-storage Oz where all the streets are paved with gold and there's, you know, low supply and huge demand and rental rates rise every day. Well, the, the answer is you, you look in your backyard and you cast a net about a two hour drive from your house. And then you begin pulling on doors, you know, creating relationships with the brokers, sending out mailers, just in, you know, the yellow letters um, campaign, just like you're doing with houses or anything else but targeting and buying lists of self-storage facility owners and then asking them those same questions. And then, you know, the good news is, I mean, you and I both know, Jay, there's so many people that want an, you know, an easy business and no business is easy. But the good news is with self-storage is that we do have a fairly simple, predictable business model that we can march on through and do our evaluation of a market and the facility to determine, you know, let's get to the true value of it. Uh, you know, make sure we're not overpaying for this, that we're getting a good deal on it, looking at all the income and the expenses and then applying a cap rate like we do with other forms of commercial real estate. But then now we dig into the market to find out whether it is um, undersupplied or oversupplied or at equilibrium. And, you know, if there's room, if there's growth so that we know if we're, you know, if we're buying this facility at 60% occupancy because the mom and pop owners, they didn't have a website, they didn't market well, and they just didn't answer the door or the phone, you know, can we really take it to 85%? Well, if all the other facilities in a, in a three to five mile radius are at 90%, yeah, we can probably, you know, increase that. If all the other facilities around it are also at 60%, well, we may not be able to move the needle on this one. And so, you know, it, those just, had, you know, painting a broad brush, you know, 30,000 foot, those are the things um, that we look at. But the good news is, Jay, is that our our market is really only three to five miles. That's all the further that people travel in in the self-storage, you know, to store their stuff. So we we can dial that in pretty tight. Interesting. Well, I'm curious, how do you find out what the occupancy rates are from the other Mm self-storage companies? Yeah, well, that's a little more. uh, Those are are some of the trade secrets. But at the end of the day... I was going, you mentioned I was going to how in the, because yeah. I, I doubt I'm going to be able to call them up and say, hey, what's your occupancy rate? Right. You know? Yeah, it doesn't work that way. So a couple of ways we tried in the beginning, you know, I, I used to go in thinking I was savvy enough to secret shop them and try to get their occupancy. But you know what? They're, they're salespeople and they're not going to tell us that because for them, there's only, you know, what size you need? 10 by 10. Well, we have one left. You better get it now. And they may have 20, you know, so how we do <laughs> So, you know, now I have the luxury of going in, you know, just with my business card and, and, and stating, hey, I'm doing a market study or, you know, we're looking to do this or we're shopping or, you know, we've, we've got a couple other lines that we use to be able to get to that. But in the beginning, you know, we, we would also just rent the cheapest unit, you know, which is a, a parking spot, you know, no, no metal around, no nothing for 30 bucks a month. And if you do that for three or four facilities, you know, within your competition, within four, four mile radius, within a day and one hundred twenty dollars. Oh, and then, and then you walk into the facility and you count the locks, you know, you walk around, you count and you have, you know, the, the most accurate up-to-date occupancy in the market and, you know, 120 bucks and a half a day. Oh my God. You see, that's like the magician and the magic trick. It looks so complicated, but when you know the Mm -hmm. answer is just downright simple. Yeah, Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I love it. Well, now, so as you know, Scott, in the Mm -hmm. world of investing in single family houses, the entire world uses the same formula when you're going to pay all cash Yep. Mm -hmm. after repaired value times 70 or 80% less repairs equals Mm -hmm. the the famous maximum allowable offer. Mm -hmm. Mayo. So everybody, (laughs) I mean, if anybody's been around, everybody Mm -hmm. knows that my guess is the maximum that you can pay all cash for a self storage facility is a little more involved and complicated than that formula mm-hmm. well it's still a very very simple answer and that answer is it depends how's that <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> so you know it, it really does i mean we come to we really look at three sets of numbers you know commercial real estate is you know all the same and how we value it it's income minus expenses gives us a net operating income and then we apply a market cap rate to that capitalization rate which is you know, dictated by whether it's an A, B or C class facility. And then, you know, what the other facilities like, you know, if it's a class C facility, what are the other class C facilities in the past year sold for, you know, what capitalization rate? So that's what we use. So from that standpoint, you know, we can kind of dial that in. But when you say, what is the maximum? Well, then there's the intrinsic value. You know, if if I have to bring in private equity and make returns for my investors, well, there's got to be a significant upside to this. So that's the second and the third set of numbers. What's it going to look like in a year from now? And what's it going to look like in three or five years from now when I create the maximum value in it and then sell? And what's that pot of money look like? 
or if I'm just going to buy it and hold it for myself, and it's a turnkey investment for me that is, you know, makes me feel better to have bricks and mortar and an alternative to the stock market. And I'm fine with um, just, you know, rolling right along with some modest increases and I buy it at a, at a six or 7% cap rate. And I'm good with that, put a management company in place. Well, that's, you know, that that's different. So it just depends upon the, again, the intrinsic value of the, the promoter or syndicator versus the individual uh, owner. And we're going to have uh, different uh, places. You know, I need a, I need a 2X or higher multiple, you know, return. So I got to take it from here to here. Somebody who's just buying it and, and holding on and just, you know, going, they just need to go from here to here over 20 years. You know, they're going to be looking at a different uh, type of property and where I may pass, they may gobble that up in a heartbeat and vice versa. So it sounds like you're saying that the amount that you are willing to offer and pay for an existing self-storage facility, part of that depends on your exit strategy, right? Yeah, it, it depends solely on that. You know, we, we look at everything in, in five-year increments and, and we're really investing based upon, you know, economic cycles. So, which is usually seven to 10 years, you know, now granted we're in an anomaly right now. This is the longest stretch that we've had of a growth. It's going, you know, beyond 10 years, but you know, we always, you know, the, the valuation that we have that the capitalization rate is tied to the interest rates. When interest rates are low, cap rates are low, which means that we're, we're selling it at, you know, this is a seller's market for us right now where we are. So if I'm looking at an investment right now that's a three-year, you know, when we're looking to sell, you know, I, I need to realize that we're probably going to be in a higher interest rate environment, which means that I'm not going to get as much money for that facility if I have to sell it in three years to appease my investors, or if we set up a three-year, you know, private placement or a syndication. So, you know, we look at each individual project based upon and, and look at the exit strategy and then do our best, you know, get off the crystal ball, shine it up as much as we can and say, here's, you know, at this time, the interest rate should be here. Our exit cap rate should be about here and here's our projected value. And so that, you know, that's how we base, you know, what we pay for and, and whether we're going to embark upon a project and, and ultimately what our projections are and the returns to ourselves and to our investors. Does that make sense? That does make sense. I can't believe how fast our time is going by. So I got time for mm -hmm. one more question mm -hmm. that, that you don't have to rush to answer, but what would you, what would you define as a good deal? In other words, mm -hmm. how do you, in other words, what's a good deal look like? I yeah. mean, like I know what a good deal in yeah. a flip in a, in a single family house flip looks like, but what's a good deal in self storage look like? Yeah, let, let me start by saying the opposite of that is a deal that's just a turnkey, in my opinion. I think that's where so many investors get in trouble is that they'll pay, uh, maybe not the top of the market, but yeah, the top of the market, and then just right at where the value is, and the thing is already maxed out. You know, the, the rent, it, occupancy is 90% and above, they're at the market rate in terms of rent, they really can't go up anymore. You know, they're, they're doing truck rentals, selling locks, boxes, and moving supplies. I mean, it's truly turnkey in every sense, and it is already the value is already built into it, and it's just kind of humming right along. Well, during a you know a recession and things change in the marketplace, you know that can do nothing but go down. So I think to answer your question a different way, that's that's what not to buy. And so I think a, a good deal is one that's going to weather those downturns in the economy. So you, you're buying it, you know, just like any other investment, including stocks, you know, you make your money when you come into it. So you, you don't overpay for it. You buy it at, at maybe a market value based on the, the current net operating income, but that's, that's because it's only 75% occupied and you can take it to 80, 85 and you build in that buffer or you've got room to expand and build more buildings because you, this facility and the others are all at 90%, 95% occupancy and you've got an extra acre you can build more buildings on. You know, those, the, it has to have some value add component to it that not only A, will weather a recession so that you can immediately jump in and create value so you'll be safe, you know, and, and term, you know, if the financing terms you know, change and you have to refi, and then B, you know, we have, I don't know, I don't know any reason why not to invest in real estate unless you're going to, you know, create value anyways and take it from here to here, you know, that, that, that here to here, that delta is going to be different for everybody, but there just has to be a value add component to it somehow, some way. So I know that's kind of a gray and, and, and vague way of answering what is a good deal, but I think it's anything that just has a value add component that will weather any changes in a refinance or, or what may happen during an economy that heads into a downturn. Perfect. Well, there you have it, my friends, Scott Myers, the definitive expert on self-storage facilities and how to minimize the risk and how to create the wealth and freedom that you really want. So Scott, before we started the show, you tell me you've got some free training at your website, right? 
We do. We do. Yeah. For all things that uh, we do in terms of uh, training, uh, you can head on over to selfstorageinvesting.com. You can pull down some free videos, some other resources. We've got some white papers and of course, a lot of articles and things, but we do have some kind of steps, six steps to get you going in the business just to see if this is something that's uh, interesting uh, uh, to you. That's awesome. Scott, my friend, thank you so much for taking the time mm -hmm. to be with us today. My pleasure, Jay. Thanks so much for having me. Good to see you again. All right, folks. Thank you for joining in on another episode of Real Estate Investing with Jay Connor. Look forward to seeing you on the next show. I'm Jay Connor of the Private Money Authority, wishing you all the best. And here from this show is to take your business to the next level. Bye for now.